morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Gary Houle. Most of you know me. I'm the treasurer for Houston Oasis. Uh, and just a note to remind everyone we're at least making an attempt to record this meeting and simulcast to Facebook and YouTube, and that's what Alexis is working on back there. Uh, I'm going to take a moment to uh, highlight. I'm just going to do one of our uh, core values because I'm really fond of reality as known through reason, so I'm just going to do that one today. Okay, our main talk today, our very own OACN, Dr. Richard Andrews. I think most everybody knows him. If you, uh, if you don't know him, you would benefit greatly by introducing yourself. He's a, a, an awesome guy. Uh, he's given a, a talk before on addiction. He currently works as a, well, I guess he's, this says you're called an addiction medicine physician, and you work at a local methadone clinic. Uh, and so this is an update to the presentation he did some time back, and uh, it was fascinating then, so I bet it's going to be fascinating again today. So help me welcome Dr. Richard Andrews. So hey everybody, um, let's see, uh, welcome to everybody, uh, including people who haven't been here for a while, so it's nice to see you back. And um, so um, yeah, I work currently at a methadone clinic. Uh, methadone is a medication that's used for opioid addiction, uh, usually heroin is the most uh, common. There are a number of other opioids and uh, all the opioid addictions are similar really. Uh, opioid meaning anything derived from or similar to the molecules that come out of the... Oh, okay. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, uh, opioid is anything that is either derived from the opium poppy plant or which is synthetically similar to the molecules uh, that come out of the opium plant, such as morphine. Um, <clears throat> And so um, I started working there in May. Now, before that, I was a family doctor for about three decades. Um, and uh, every family doctor deals with addiction on some level, of course. Um, the most common uh, being nicotine addiction with cigarettes, uh, uh, but also alcohol to a certain extent. <clears throat> and, um, and then I started a few a couple years ago, started uh, treating some opioid addiction using a medicine that you may have heard of called Suboxone. Uh, uh, the, uh, that's the brand name. The generic name for that is buprenorphine. Um, and, uh, and then, but, but I couldn't prescribe methadone because in the U.S. Uh, only methadone clinics can prescribe and dispense methadone for addiction. Now, any doctor can prescribe methadone for pain, for example. So any doctor can do that. But prescribing it for addiction with current law can only take place in a methadone clinic, a tightly regulated form of clinic. Um, and I, you know, since I'm interested in becoming an addiction medicine specialist, uh, I wanted to work in a methadone clinic so I would have some experience with that. And I've been doing that since May. I no longer do family medicine, uh, and um, and I'm really enjoying my my work at the methadone clinic. Um, a typical day um, for the patients and the staff starts before 6 a.m. Um, and uh, they're lining up and and getting uh, dispensed their methadone. Um, a, a small number of them, instead of methadone, may be getting uh, uh, injectable naltrexone, which is a medicine that blocks the effect of certain drugs, for example, blocks the effects of opioids and blocks the effect of alcohol. Uh, and it's an injection that lasts four weeks. And so during those four weeks after the injection, the patient, at least in theory, is less interested in using one of those drugs because when they do use it, not very much happens. 
because the effect of it is blocked. And so for some patients, that is quite effective. Um, and, uh, and then we also prescribe and dispense Suboxone, which I mentioned before, or more accurately, buprenorphine, uh, which is, so, so buprenorphine and methadone then are both opioids. So some people would say, well, why are you giving opioids to somebody with an opioid problem? Um, and uh, so that's the current, but the current science, uh, as we'll see, um, uh, really suggests, and this is with large numbers of people over many years in many countries, uh, it seems that when we simply take the Nancy Reagan approach of just say no, um, uh, that's great. It works with some people. Uh, however, it doesn't work with a huge number of people, particularly people who are already addicted to something. Um, and when that approach is, which, which used to be the standard approach, it was sort of understood that, um, that you need to come off the drug, period, end of story, and nothing else will work. Well, the only problem with that, when you're looking at large numbers of people, is 80% of the time it doesn't work. If it worked, that would be great. And when it does work, as it does sometimes, that's also great. But if you insist on, on one size fits all, <clears throat> then you're gonna have more overdose deaths, for example. Um, because the opioid, in addition to having other complex effects, uh, acts like an antidepressant. Uh, that's one of the effects that opioids have, is it acts like an antidepressant. And so you're talking about taking somebody, um, frequently somebody with uh, psychiatric illness, which is, which is hugely common in people with addictions, uh, and you're taking away uh, something that is, in effect, treating their mental health condition. It may not be treating it in a good way or in a safe way, but it is treating it. And if you yank that rug out from underneath the person, then bad things can happen. Because then they will seek the drug on the street. And the, one of the reasons that it seems reasonable to those of us uh, who, who believe in this approach anyway, the reason it's, it, it works to give somebody an opioid when they have an opioid problem is the alternative is they will look for it on the street. And when you get an opioid on the street, whether it's heroin or whatever it is, then you risk uh, HIV, hepatitis B, hepatitis C, you risk having it contaminated with fentanyl, which is an extremely strong opioid, uh, 50 times stronger than morphine, fentanyl, uh, and that's on the low estimate. Some people say it's 100 times stronger than morphine. Heroin, by the way, is only two times stronger than morphine, which is strong, but compared to fentanyl, it's, it's, it's nothing. So, uh, so we would wrap that, you know, the benefit of a person coming into the methadone clinic is they are getting uh, a known quantity of a drug, it's still an opioid, and you can overdose on even a prescribed medication if you're not careful. Uh, the body doesn't know if it's prescribed or not. It's just an opioid, right? Mm. Uh, and so, but at least at the clinic, they're getting a clean drug with an exact dosage, and they're monitored daily to see how they're doing on it. One of the aspects of regulation of a methadone clinic is that at least for the first three months or so, the person has to come in every single day and they're monitored by the nurses. They're assessed by the nurses. If a person comes in and their speech is slurred and they're looking drowsy and so on and so forth, then they may not get dosed on that day or they may get dosed with a lower amount because we don't want to cause an overdose, right? Um, it's also very common uh, for patients to be using multiple drugs. Uh, that can include alcohol or Xanax, for example. Uh, these are depressant drugs, and the additive effect of these other depressants, uh, I'm saying depressants in terms of its, of its effect on the brain, uh, that can be fatal. You know, sometimes uh, an overdose is a function of multiple things rather than simply one thing. And so, so the benefit, uh, even though it's a pain in the neck for the addict to have to go to the clinic every single day, 
um, and, and get their medication. One of the benefits of it is we're able to monitor their progress. As we change the dose of their methadone up or down, we're able to see what the effect of that was. If I, if I took them from 40 milligrams yesterday to 50 milligrams today, tomorrow we'll be able to see, is that too much for the person? Is that too little for the person? You see, is it just right? Is it like baby bear's porridge where it's just right, you see? Uh, and, then, uh, and then each individual ideally will get to a dose and that could be anywhere at our clinic, that could be anywhere from one milligram up to 120 milligrams of methadone. Uh, each person will find the dose at which they're no longer having withdrawal symptoms or cravings. Well, cravings is a withdrawal symptom, but craving, craving, wanting the drug is the last withdrawal symptom to go away. Often all the physical withdrawal symptoms will be gone at a particular dose, but the craving is still very strong. Well, if we don't address that craving, they're going to seek additional medicine on the street. And then with the additional medicine comes, in particular, the risk of overdose. <clears throat> One of the things we do at the methadone clinic also, uh, many of you may have heard of Narcan. Narcan is the brand name, naloxone is the generic name or scientific name of the medicine. <clears throat> naloxone is an opioid blocker. It is remarkably effective. When a person has an overdose, uh, a single spray of this into the nose generally works within two minutes, sometimes works instantly, but up to two minutes would be normal, and it goes in and, and kicks the opioid that is in excess, uh, kicks it off of the receptors in the brain, uh, and then ideally, at least, they uh, are no longer at risk for overdose. I say ideally because remember what I said about fentanyl being extremely strong. Uh, sometimes you have to do another Narcan. Fortunately, each kit comes with two in it. Now, if you know somebody who is, uh, has an opioid issue, uh, if you approach me after the talk, I'll let you know about a website that the individual can write to, anybody can write to, really, and sign up for uh, a box of this each month for free coming right to your address. So if, if you want that information, uh, you can talk to me afterwards. Um, and... Um, by the way, I wanted to, before I forget, I wanted to apologize for, for being your speaker again. Uh, and I realized that some of you were thinking, why are we hearing from him again? Didn't we just hear from him? Yes, you did. And, uh, but we are trying to fill up the speaker schedule. Uh, and I actually wasn't supposed to speak until next week, but then uh, that, that uh, changed uh, and because the other speaker couldn't do it. And so... Um, so I was asked, would I, you know, is there something I can talk about? Uh, and so uh, at some point, we'll have a little more variety in the speakers, don't worry. <laughs> so um, I hope you can see the slides okay. Um, I, I got that picture because there are many different kinds of addiction. Uh, of course, here we see gambling, which uh, is very interesting. Many of you have heard of what's called the... Um, psychiatric uh, diagnosis manual called DSM-5. Um, uh, there were obviously four previous versions. Uh, and in all the versions up until this version, uh, gambling might have been talked about, but it wasn't officially labeled an addiction. One very big change between DSM-4 and DSM-5 is that gambling officially became an addiction. And that's a, that's a bigger change than it sounds like, because up until then it was thought that only substances like heroin or alcohol could be addiction. How can you possibly have an addiction to a behavior, to something that isn't a substance? But basically because of the accumulating scientific evidence, it was clear that in every way uh, Gambling addiction meets the criteria for addiction, uh, and so we had to recognize it as such. But if one non-substance can be an addiction, that means there's a whole variety of other things 
okay, that can also constitute an addiction and which really are, in fact, you know. Uh, in fact, I'm going to turn my phone upside down so I don't, so I don't see it. Um, but, uh, and, and that applies to a large number of human beings right now on the planet, right? <clears throat> so, um, no, where was I? Um, so anyway, uh, but that was a big change from DSM-4 to DSM-5, the recognition that non-substances also uh, can be an addiction. And that shouldn't surprise us too much because when we look at the chemistry in the brain of what addiction is, now we're still learning what that is, of course. The brain is a slightly complicated place, as you know. <clears throat> uh, but it turns out that attachment to another person we don't use the word addiction there, but that's really the machinery that is being employed, you might say, or some people say hijacked in addiction. It, it's really, in fact, it's because when we see someone we love, someone we're attached to, <clears throat> we get a little dopamine hit, right? And we're hearing a lot about dopamine these days. <clears throat> so, um, and then we get you know, it, 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 it makes sense in terms of evolution for evolution to have a mechanism like a, like a reward circuit in the brain which rewards with, with a pleasure sensation things that are favorable to the organism <clears throat> and favorable to reproducing in particular, right? Such as eating, uh, sex, um, and, and really anything that you enjoy, whether it's classical music or so, Sudoku or knitting or whatever it is, they all go through that same common pathway ultimately, which involves dopamine. Now dopamine is used in, a whole, in, in several parts of the brain for different things because nature uh, doesn't like to invent a new molecule if it doesn't have to. It simply goes to the library, finds an existing molecule, and uses it for another purpose. For example, dopamine is involved in certain aspects of physical movement, having nothing to do with addiction or pleasure. So, um, as is my tendency, I will wander. So, uh, let's see here. Now, there are different definitions for addiction. Historically, it was thought of as a moral failure, a weakness, um, not terribly scientific. Those are basically opinions and sometimes religiously influenced opinions at that. Um, that was much of the motivation behind the alcohol prohibition um, from 1920 to 1933 was basically religious people saying we need to stop this scourge of alcohol and clearly the best way to do that is to make it illegal. Well, by 1933, it was extremely clear that making something illegal does not necessarily make it better. And so they got rid of the prohibition on alcohol but maintained the prohibition on other drugs. Um, <clears throat> So the, the book that I am currently reading, I'm not quite finished yet because I thought I was going to give this talk next week, uh, but I'm halfway through it and I highly recommend it if you're interested in this subject. It's called Unbroken Brain. The author's name is Maya Salovitz and she's one of the sharpest writers on the addiction scene and experienced addiction herself, uh, has um, Asperger's syndrome, uh, it turns out that uh, autism spectrum disorders uh, is one of the uh, learning disorders or developmental disorders that has some aspects in common with addiction and which may predispose people to addiction. Uh, for example, it leads, this is what Maya Salovitz talks about in her own world, um, is uh, it leads to a certain degree of social isolation. And when you're socially isolated, it can make you unhappy, not surprisingly. Um, and so then um, that can predispose the brain to finding pleasure in other things. Uh, and then when you do eventually experience or, or are exposed to some of these substances, what like opioids, for example, then your brain may be set up 
to enjoy it a little bit too much because it didn't experience uh, normal pleasure in other things, like socializing, for example. If you have difficulty socializing with other people, you're not going to get, especially at, at, at vulnerable stages in your childhood, you may not be getting those pleasurable dopamine hits, which is normal. And then the brain develops in a normal way. Uh, and so now you have a brain that is primed to be more susceptible to addiction to a substance or to a behavior, as we've said, with gambling. Remember I talked about the difference between the DSM-4 and the DSM-5, the Diagnostic Manual for Psychiatry. Uh, another big difference in going from the last edition to this edition is the term drug abuse is no longer uh, used. It's now drug use. You'll see the term drug abuse used a lot, but it's really an older term um, it was really dropped a number of years ago, but it's still in the language. Um, but because stigma against addicts is huge, a huge issue, uh, and prevents people from getting the care that they need, uh, it reinforces negative stereotypes, uh, which they believe about themselves and which do not help the situation, right? You got somebody with low esteem to begin with, and now you're insisting on repeating outdated, unscientific language and notions which simply make the problem worse. Now, the official current definition of addiction, if you can read it on the screen, I know it's a little bit dark. Um, I don't know, maybe we can turn out the lights up in the front here. Um, compulsive use of a substance or compulsive engagement in a behavior despite ongoing negative consequences. That's the definition. So uh, some of this I've already talked about. In terms of what's thought to be the, uh, the cause of addiction, well, it's complicated. We're still learning. Uh, certainly, I'm still learning. It's thought that roughly half of the cause of addiction is genetic. Now, that doesn't mean that it applies to everybody. Obviously, at 50%, it doesn't. Um, but that can predispose you. And not necessarily a gene that says you're going to get addicted. It's not quite that straightforward. But it could be genes, for example, or a genetic profile. A lot of these things are multi-gene things, right? Not one gene that does it, but multiple genes working together. For example, a gene that predisposes, or a set of genes that predisposes you to depression, to bipolar disorder, to an autism spectrum disorder, to ADHD. Uh, uh, or, for example, sometimes it's things that happened to you. War, for example. I think my father had PTSD uh, because of his involvement in war activities. Uh, now, as a college kid and a Navy pilot, he was a bit of a drinker to begin with, but a lot of times that stuff peters out after you're in your 20s, mid-20s, late 30s. Um, but if you experience war, uh, not only the things that you do to other people, but the things that are done to you, uh, and the things that happen to your friends, these things can predispose to uh, addiction. So, um, and, and then environment or learning, the things that are around you, um, the uh, Maya Salovitz, uh, along with other people, um, feels that we're better off characterizing addiction as a learning disorder rather than as calling it a brain disease. Again, a common model of addiction is to think of it as a brain disease. Now, you could say there's not much of a difference between a learning disorder and a brain disease, and I would agree with that. Uh, but, but the point she's making is, because there are people, I mean, with PET scans and various other imaging techniques of the brain, there are people who are always looking for changes in the brain. And then they say, aha, I found a change in the brain, therefore it's a disease. The drug did that to the brain. Uh, you may remember those of you who were old enough, um, and uh, none of you were old enough really, you know, but, but if you were old enough, you might remember uh, an ad from a number of years ago, um, which was put out by some government entity or another, and it showed some eggs frying in a pan. 
Uh, and of course, the the uh, the, int the, uh, the 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 voice uh, intonation over that was, "This is your brain on drugs," right? Uh, and it was meant to scare people, and it did scare a lot of people. Um, uh, it's not clear that it's true, however. In other words, um, you may also have heard about uh, uh, a study looking at London uh, taxi drivers uh, that found visible changes in the brain, certain structures in the brain getting larger, for example, when they had been taxi drivers for a while compared to before they were taxi drivers. In other words, learning itself causes physical changes in the brain that we can see on imaging. Learning does that, and yet learning is normal, right? Or it can be normal. It's not always normal. And so the point that Maya Salovitz makes is, yes, there are changes in the brain. It's learning. And you can either have appropriate, healthy, constructive learning, or you can have learning that is not so constructive. Uh, and so if you're learning, you know, uh, that the world is not a safe place, for example, then that's, that's something that your brain learns. And yes, you can put that person in a PET scan and you can see a change in the brain. Uh, but it's not a persistent change. You see, when we learn new things, the structures of the brain change again. They are what's called plastic, uh, meaning that they change, right? So uh, again, we want to have as scientifically accurate an understanding of these things as we can. Otherwise, we can't possibly prevent things or help people. Um, by the way, somebody, Kevin, uh, let me know, or somebody let me know when I'm uh, going on for too long. Now, uh, in, in terms of environment, uh, which drugs are available to you is obviously going to make a difference. If you're in a location where a particular drug simply isn't available, Clearly, you're not going to get addicted to that drug. Um, and so um, if you're in certain places in Saudi Arabia, for example, it's going to be hard to get a hold of alcohol. Now, as my brother Ted here can tell you, he lived in Saudi Arabia for a few years. And there is alcohol there, but it's only available to certain people at certain times. Uh, and of course, if you're a prince, for example, or uh, you know, uh, an upper echelon businessman, and it is businessman over there, I'm sure there aren't too many business women, uh, then you can simply drive across a bridge to uh, Bahrain, which is a nearby uh, island nation, uh, and get all the alcohol you want, and they do. So alcohol is available depending on who you are. And um, you know, in this country, coffee, I would say, is a little more popular than tea overall. In some parts of the world, tea is more available than coffee. Uh, and you can be addicted to either one, although the amount of caffeine that's in tea is less than the amount that's in coffee, typically, unless it's decaffeinated coffee. So, so again, that, co that constitutes part of your environment, and it, and it may help explain, will, it will help explain uh, which substance you may get dependent on. Now, I've been saying for a number of years that addiction per se is not harmful. In other words, uh, it, it's likely true, many people suggest that half the people, half the adults in the world are probably addicted to caffeine on one level or another. Um, and uh, I drank some before coming up here, and we have some over here if you're interested. Uh, and, yet, and yet caffeine is widely available, inexpensive, uh, it's regulated in the sense that, you know, you, you know, the Food and Drug Act says you can't be putting fentanyl into the coffee that you buy from the store and that sort of thing. So, you know, because it's regulated, it is safe. Now, if you consume too much of it, it won't be safe. But that's true of anything, right? You consume too much of it, it's not going to be safe. But if you simply say somebody has an addiction, you really haven't told me enough uh, to, to help me determine is that safe or is it not right? Um, we need more information. Um, now, we keep hearing a lot about dopamine. There are many chemicals and many systems in the body and in the brain. Uh, we talked about the reward circuits of the brain, and there are many things, many circuits in the brain that talk to each other, and then there's feedback loops, very complicated. We don't even know half of it yet. But the final common pathway in the brain for the reward circuit, the pleasure circuit, is 
dopamine is the is the chemical that's involved in that uh, in that process. Uh, and so um, you've heard about the synapse, which is basically just a gap between two nerve cells, right? And then uh, the impulse, the nerve impulse comes down uh, and then it releases dopamine into that gap, a chemical. The, that chemical dopamine then uh, hits a receptor on the other side for the other nerve cell and then, and then causes that pleasure sensation that we're familiar with. Again, when you enjoy any pleasurable sensation, regardless of what it is, then uh, including being here at Oasis, hopefully, then uh, that is what's going on chemically. Uh, why does evolution care about pleasure? Well, it's a mechanism. Uh, Jahan over here is studying uh, artificial intelligence, and literally his homework assignment last week was to start figuring out if you're going to employ artificial intelligence in a system, how do you go about doing that? You know, what, how do you set up the problem, blah, blah, blah. If you want to learn more about that, talk to Jahan, not to me. Um, but it makes sense when evolution is, forgive me, designing a system, or, or when it's evolving more accurately, that having a process where certain things are rewarded, like eating food, for example, obviously you want the, oh, two more minutes, uh, or uh, uh, avoiding certain things, like toxins, for example, it's obviously useful to have those mechanisms in there. Now, uh, oh. Uh, I know you can't see this very well and I apologize, but dopamine levels in rat brains were measured and, um, and, and in terms of units. So there was a baseline level of dopamine uh, in, in the brain and, and in the reward circuits and then with different things, including food and sex, they measured the dopamine rise. So uh, it went up to about 100 with food, it went up to about 200 with sex, so now you know, food is, sex is exactly twice as enjoyable as food. I suppose it depends on the food and it depends on the sex, but there it is. So um, now, with, with cocaine, it went up to about 350. With nicotine, it was about 230, but it kind of went up and came down quickly. With morphine, it was about 200, about equivalent to sex. With amphetamine, it was 1250, 1,250, far more than all the other ones. Now, um, does that mean amphetamines are the most dangerous one? Not necessarily, because it's complicated, there's a lot of other factors, et cetera, et cetera, right? But just to give you an idea, amphetamine really hits that pleasure center. Now, don't rush right out and use amphetamines, please. Um, and alcohol, again, is around 200 or so. Uh, but you can be addicted to your loved ones, as I said. Uh, this is just to say that, uh, oh, and this is a, an interesting song by, I've always liked this song by Paul Simon, I Am A Rock. But it describes somebody who's shutting in, who's shutting off the, you know, because he was disappointed in love, he, uh, so I have my books and my poetry to protect me. I am shielded in my armor hiding in my room, safe within my womb. I touch no one and no one touches me. Uh, I am a rock, I am an island, and a rock feels no pain. An island uh, never cries. So, um, so uh, let's see here. Uh, and I don't think I have time for some of these other ones, but basically the idea is that if we're not scientific in our understanding of what addiction really is, and I mean really hardcore evidence-based stuff, um, for example, a study in Sweden involved looking at the entire Swedish population. That's a large study. You can really draw conclusions from that. But simply having an opinion like, I think this or I think that, well, everyone can have their opinion, but it's nice when there's some evidence behind it because we can't possibly prevent things or help people if we're ascribing wrong mechanisms to things. And I guess I'll stop there. Oh, I think I have one minute. Is that what you're saying? Oh, okay. Oh, good. I can say one more thing. Let's see. <laughs> so there's... Um, well, the odds of alcoholism, for example, if you start drinking at 14 or younger, 
uh, are 50 percent. 50 percent chance that you will develop an alcohol use disorder if you start drinking uh, before 14 or before 15, I should say. And it's similar with other drugs. The, the adolescent brain, the young adult brain, because it isn't fully developed and because it's in learning mode. Remember we talked about addiction perhaps being a learning disorder. If you're exposed to some of these things when you're at a vulnerable phase, that's going to affect what happens. It doesn't guarantee that you'll have an addiction problem, but it increases the likelihood of it. <clears throat> and I guess I'm finished. So thank you. Thanks for coming, everybody. Special thanks to Richard and JBZ for playing for us today. Um, check out uh, Johnny's Facebook post for uh, writing to Alethea. And stay, you know, stay in touch with our, our uh, Facebook and email and all that good stuff so you can keep track of what we're doing these days. And I uh, hope to see you all next week. So thanks again. Be safe.